How many of you um, ever take pictures of your food? You know what I'm talking about, right? Like, so you go out to a restaurant, and you, you order something that you're excited about, and it comes, and it looks really cool, and you can't eat until you take the pictures of your food, right? Um, and because it completes your enjoyment of that. Or, or maybe, maybe you're uh, in the kitchen uh, cooking up some very gourmet, you know, specialty, and it's looking awesome, and you want to share it. So you, you take a picture of it, and or maybe it's, you know, this was in my family, like when, when the whole family would be gathered for dinner and then like all the food gets on the table and, and you gather around before you get to actually start dinner and eating, you have to take a picture of all of it with the food. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? Well, chances are we probably, we, we take those pictures and we share them or we text them or we email them or we post them or we, we, we share them with others. Maybe we're, we just want to share, look at this awesome food I'm about to have. Or maybe we're, we're bragging, bragging it a little bit. Look, look what I'm making. You know, look how awesome this is. Um, but we want to express to others the amazement of this meal that we're about to enjoy and, and that kind of sharing it, bragging about it, expressing it, um, showing them how excited we are about this food kind of completes our enjoyment of that. So we, get, we, can, we can get pretty excited about a meal. We can get pretty excited about cars. I, I know guys who park their cars in a certain place so that they can sit um, on their lunch break and be able to look at their car. Which is clean, of course, because they wash it every day. Uh, we get excited about our houses, like we, we decorate them up, put new stuff, take pictures, post that. We get excited. We get excited about our investments. You know, we check the Dow. We get excited about. Uh, we get excited about our sports teams. Don't even have to go there, do I? We wear the colors. We we read up who, who what what new players are coming in or being traded, what the news is, and when it comes game time, we lose our minds. Right? We get excited about that. We want to share. Did you see that? We get excited about our kids. I don't even have to go there either. We have albums and albums and albums of pictures of our kids, and we will, we will talk about our kids or our grandkids to anybody who listens. There's a lot of things we get really excited about, isn't there? Shouldn't we even get m- more excited about our God? But here's the thing. We have a problem with praise. Here's, the, here's our problem with praise. You telling me to do it doesn't make me want to do it. You telling me that I should be praising God doesn't make me want to praise God. No, no matter how much time you spend showing me how important it is or telling me how important it is a thing to do, that's not going to move my heart from being grumpy about it to being joyful about it. I mean, think about the meal. If you're not that excited about that meal, you're not going to be taking pictures of it and posting it, right? You're going to be a little bit more like, like, like my kids. You know, like, oh, let's take a picture of this. Dad! Or, or think about the sports team. You can't make someone else cheer for your team, right? I mean, they... You know, what are they, they're woo, woo, I don't care. If they don't care, they have to actually care about the team to cheer for the team. You have to actually care about the team to cheer for the team. And so our problem with praise is that just somebody telling us to do it isn't enough to make us want to do it. We need a reason. And so Psalm 145 gives us some reasons to praise. The first one is this, God's providence. God's providence produces praise. So Psalm 145 speaks of the providential love of God, his his providence, his providence, his providing, the fact that God provides for all people on earth, for all of his creation on earth with his wonderful, awesome works. And just, just some words from, we're not reading the whole psalm again during the message, but just, just some words and phrases from there. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. He's faithful to all of his promises, loving toward all he has made. And then there's that verse that we often, we, we often use these, this in our prayer. A lot of pastors, like they have this kind of in their back pocket to start a prayer with because it's, it's so fitting. Um, it, it's a prayer of all of God's creation speaking toward him. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living 
thing. God's faithful to all his promises. And the promise being talked about here, the promise he's faithful to, is the promise that he made to Noah. The promise that God made to Noah after the flood that he would continue providing for all of creation, that he would continue to care for all creation. Here's what that promise uh, sounded like in Genesis chapter 8. Um, here's the promise he made Noah. As long as the earth endures, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. God will keep providing for us by compelling the universe to keep doing what it's doing. So through this universe, through this world, God provides for our needs. God cares for us. God blesses the, us. He blesses not only believers, he blesses unbelievers. Not only the righteous, but the unrighteous. All people, everyone, everyone living on this earth is blessed by the fact that, that day and night, that summer and winter, that seed time and harvest will never cease. Jesus explained that our Father in heaven causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So it doesn't matter if you're a churchgoer or not a churchgoer, if you believe in God or don't believe in God, you are being blessed by this world we live in. And so this world is never going to be hell. As much as, we, as it feels like hell sometimes, this world is never hell because God's presence is here. And God's presence is going to, God's presence is going to keep powering it to provide for all people, whether we deserve it or not. It, it's just, it's fascinating to think what all goes into the fact that, that God makes a promise that sounds like um, seed time, harvest, cold, heat, summer, winter, day, night will never cease. It's just incredible to think about what God does. Imagine a, a, a submarine operator um, um, operating a submarine has all these dials, all these controls and dials that they have to be monitoring, watching. And every single one of them um, has to be just right for something to work. Maybe kind of like our AV table has all those things back there. And everything has to be just right for something to work. All right? So you're watching. And, but if you're on a submarine, um, if one thing goes wrong, you're all in a lot of trouble. So imagine the things God has to look after for all of this to work. The, the sun is 93 million miles away from the earth. The earth is a tiny dot, compared to the, tiny dot compared to the sun, and it's 93 million miles away. Yet if the earth were one degree farther away, we, we'd all freeze and die. If it was one degree closer, we would all burn up. The moon, if the moon was any larger or closer, the tides would destroy all the coastlines in the world. But if it were any smaller or farther away, all the oceans would die because of the lack of nutrient movement. If Jupiter, if Jupiter were any um, closer to our Earth, it would ruin the Earth's orbit and, and send us off of orbit. If it were any farther away, uh, we, the Earth would get peppered by asteroids and comets. All of the planets in our solar system rotate on a 90-degree axis. All of them, except the earth, 23 and a third. And if it were 25 degrees or 21 degrees, all life on planet earth would stop. The earth's gravity on the surface of the earth, if the earth's gravity uh, was any stronger, it would hold in all the ammonia and the methane and we would all choke to death. If it were any lighter, it would let all the moisture uh, released into the atmosphere and we would have nothing to drink, no liquid on earth to drink. If the earth's crust were any thicker, it would, it would hold all the oxygen in and we would not have air to breathe. If it were any thinner, it would be shaking beneath us and we wouldn't have ground to stand on. And we could just go all day long. There are just, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things that if it isn't exactly right, all life on planet Earth ends. Do you understand what was in that promise that God made Noah and all those dials that God is looking at, keeping everything going exactly just right for us to be living on this earth? Isn't God incredible? Isn't he incredible? God provides for every living creature. 
God provides for you and me. (laughs) And his providence gives me a reason to praise him. That is a reason. Here's the next reason. God's compassion produces praise. Psalm 145 speaks of the compassionate love of God, the price that he paid for us, the grace and mercy that he showed us, his wonderful works, his, his great deeds on our behalf, his, his amazing goodness, his righteousness. Just some words again from the psalm, from verses 8 and 9. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. His heart goes out. He loves us. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving towards all he has made. The Lord is near to all who call on him and to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. God loves us even though we don't deserve it. And God has saved us through Jesus. All of those words speak of how God has saved us. They all speak of the good news of the gospel. The the righteousness of God that he gave us through Jesus. Because Jesus lived that perfect righteous life here. And gave you and me credit for it. The the mercy and compassion he's shown us by by dying to pay our, 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 our debt. And to pay for our sin, take our sins away so we could be forgiven, so God could see us as righteous, so we could be near God instead of far to him. That's a loving God. That's a compassionate God. That is this merciful, forgiving, loving God that all of Scripture speaks about and is featured right here. That compassion changed our lives. It changed David's lives. That is why we praise God. That's why our lives are filled with more joy than guilt. We know we failed a righteous God, and and certainly that always convicts us of guilt. But that righteous God is loving toward all he has made and has erased our guilt through his son Jesus, and that's why we get to live with joy. So, the last verse of uh, of the psalm says, So, because of all that, so, my mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. So, because of all that, God, you're incredible. You're incredible. You give me a reason to want to praise you every day like David did. I want to praise God on my own, in my own thoughts. I want to praise God together with his people, with you. I want to hear you praising with me. I want to praise him on my own. I want to praise him together. I want to praise God like David did in Psalm 145. With all those words, with all those phrases glorifying his name, I want to praise him like that. But my prayers, my prayers don't always sound like Psalm 145. Why don't my prayers sound like that? I mean, we can just be honest here. Our prayers don't always sound like Psalm 145. Actively and intentionally remembering and thinking about and pondering God's providence and God's compassion, God's love. That gives us reason to praise him. And so our prayers will get closer to Psalm 145 the more we're actively remembering and being reminded and thinking about the fact how incredible God is as he provides for us, and how incredible God is as he loves us and has compassion and forgiveness for us. Jesus is going to help us further in this by teaching us something that's very important. Next point is this, that prayer begins with praise. Prayer begins with praise. It doesn't end with praise. It begins with praise. So when Jesus' followers asked him, Lord, teach us how to pray, he said, here's how you pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. You start there. You start by praising his name, by hallowing his name, by telling him that he's incredible. And so why start there? Why start uh, talking to God by doing that? Why do we want to start there when we talk to God? Because then we acknowledge who it is we're talking to. Can we talk? (laughs) God, you're incredible. 
I want you to know that I know who you are. You are awesome. You are glorious. Your name is holy. All creation worships you. Your, your, your splendor is, is glorious. Your works are awesome. Your, your love, your grace is, is amazing. You are righteous. I want to I, I wanna exalt you. I just want to, I just want to, I just want to enjoy you for a moment. And I want you to know that I enjoy you. Now, here, here's, why, here's why Jesus knows that it's best for us to start our, our prayer with worship. Because all of our problems are primarily worship problems. See, all, all, every, every problem and need that we have is because we're putting something other than God at the center of our lives. So, Worship is not only um, the best thing for prayer to start with. Worship is the best thing for all of life to start with. Because we all worship something. We're all going to worship something. We all worship something. We, our hearts were made to worship. We were created to worship. And so, so we, we look for things to worship. We look for things to let us know that everything's going to be okay. We look for things to give us purpose, to give us hope, to give us love. But are we worshiping the creator or do we end up sometimes worshiping the things that he created? We all look for happiness. And so we all attach ourselves to things that we think will make us happy. But we often, we often misidentify what will make us happy. And so we end up loving things more than God that we should be loving less than God. We end up sometimes loving things that God gave us more than the God who gave them to us. And that always leads to problems. It always leads to problems. If a person loves, if a person loves making money more than, let's say, justice and love, he's going to end up exploiting his employees. If a man loves a career more than his children, his family's going to fall apart. If a wife loves her husband the way that she should be loving God, He's never going to be able to live up those expectations. We, we run into all kinds of misery when we make something more important than God, when we love something more than we love God. And so only when God's love is the most important thing in our lives can we love our loved ones well. So here's the thing I, I, I want us to, th- here's the thing I want us to maybe leave with today is this. Worship God, praise God, worship God, worship God looking through the things God gives us to the one who gives them to us. We worship God looking through those things he gives us and blesses us with to the one who gives them to us. So you can worship God with that meal you're going to eat that you're going to take a picture of first. You can worship God by eating that meal and taking a picture of it. Just don't let your worship stop with that meal. Don't worship the meal. Enjoy that meal and that drink that goes with it and how wonderful it tastes and how that fills you up and how it quenches your thirst and quenches your hunger and take pictures of it and share it with all your friends and do that all in a way that that thanks God who blesses you with that meal. So eat that meal thinking, God, you're incredible. You're incredible that you made this taste so good, that this drink quenches my thirst so well that I, I just get to appreciate and enjoy you in this. You're incredible that you would give us a way to keep our energy and power us to live our lives in a way that tastes good and blesses me. God, you're incredible. You can worship God as you eat a meal. You can worship God um, as you think about your home. So not just that it's a castle to your honor, but that it's, it's, it's shelter that God has blessed you with. And so worship God through that home that he's given you to the one who's blessed you with it. Um, of, of you, let's say you travel somewhere and you see a beautiful sight. Don't worship the sight. Don't worship the view. Worship the one who's giving you that as a beautiful painting. Worship the one who, who just is blessing your life through that. Um, your, your spouse, your kids, your greatest blessing on this earth, spouse, kids, grandkids, greatest blessing on earth. Don't worship them. Don't treat them like God. They're not good gods. 
but worship God through them. See God in them. As you appreciate all the joy they bring into your lives, see that as a blessing from God and let it lead you to say, God, you're incredible. Uh, Mike Novotny wrote a book this year called, um, he's one of our pastors in our church body, um, called uh, The Three, Three Words That Will Change Your Life. And he talks about how just every day, the, the little experiences that we experience, the little blessings, the little joys that, that come our way should remind us of God who's blessing us with them. And, and his little code word that he, he, he thinks about when he, when, he, when he realizes it's one of those things is he just calls it this, this. So it could be just your, your daughter just smiles at you and it just, it just makes you feel good inside. And that's awesome. But don't just see your daughter smile. See God smiling through her. See, see God through that. Let that lead you to say, God's incredible. That's this. Or you have a, a little treat, whatever, a donut or a hamburger that just tastes great. It just it brings some joy to you, even though it's not good for you. You just see God uh, blessing you, giving you some joy. Um, someone tells a funny joke that's clean, of course. A funny joke and it makes you laugh. And it feels good to laugh. That's a gift from God. You enjoy a drink. You enjoy a, you enjoy a day in the pool. You enjoy a, a, just a sunset as you're driving home. And it just makes you go, wow. Just think about that as this. See God in this. All the little things. Um, someone just does something kind for you. See God in this. See God through that. So we worship God through the things he blesses us with, to the one who blesses us. We don't let our worship stop in those things. Let our worship go through that to the one who gives it to us so that it leads us to say, God, you're incredible. When you enjoy something, the only way to complete your joy of it is to express your joy of it. I'll give you an example. You hear this great song. What do you do? You go and play it for somebody. If you want them to hear it, you've you got to hear this song. This is awesome. Because your joy in that song won't be complete until you can share it with someone and then enjoy it together with them. Or you're watching a game. Not that we have a lot of games these days, but you're watching a sports game. You see this great play. And you're like, you, what do you do? You, you go, you tell someone, have, did you see that? Did you see that guy do that? Did you see that girl do that? It was incredible. You share it with them because your joy won't be complete until you can experience it together with someone. Right? Same with a great book you read or a great movie you see or, or whatever. Um, we share these things with others because our joy in them won't be complete until we can share it and express it and enjoy it with them. So the reason that God wants us to worship him is so that our joy in him, he wants our joy in him to be complete. He wants us to have the joy of expressing our worship for him. Ultimately, it's about God loving us. Not praising God, not praising God is limiting our enjoyment of God. So starting by telling God, God, you're incredible, sets the context for, it sets the context for all the other stuff you want to talk to him about, especially in prayer. There was a woman who learned this, and she told her pastor, uh, when I used to pray, I used to start by jumping right into this long list of things that I wanted to ask God for, needs that I wanted to ask him for. But the longer it went on, you know, with all the, the, all the problems needs, and the more I went into all that, the more anxious I would feel, the more burdened I would feel in all of that. So now, now I start by just spending some time thinking about how good and how wise God is. And, and, and how many prayers of mine he's already answered. And by the time I finally get around to my needs, I just put those in his hands and I, I don't feel the burden of them anymore. So God, as you pray, God, I have some stuff that we got to talk about. But before I get into all that, I just want you to know that, that I know who it is that I'm talking to. All right? I just I want you to know how incredible I know that you are. I want you to know how much your name means to me. You know, God... In his word, God told us what his name means. He told us exactly what his name means. In the book of Exodus, Moses was asking what his name meant, and here God said, here's what my name is. The Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. 
That's what God did for us in Jesus. And that is what moved David to write this psalm, Psalm 145. He used those words in this psalm to describe God's love. And finally, those words foreshadowed what Jesus was coming to do for us because Jesus, the king, praised the king in our place. Jesus perfectly praised God and proclaimed his name and then gave us credit for it. So, does that solve our problem with praise? Does it give us a reason to praise? Because that's what Psalm 145 is designed to do. David wrote the psalm, Psalm 145. It was designed to give us the reason to praise because the next five psalms, which are the last five psalms in the book of Psalms, all start out with a command, an imperative. Praise the Lord. It's really, it's an imperative, it's command. It's basically saying, praise you, the Lord. You all, praise the Lord. So Psalm 45 is giving us all these reasons to be praising the Lord, and then the last five psalms of the book then just say, praise the Lord. Praise you, the Lord. You know what it looks like in Hebrew? This. Hallelujah. Praise you, the Lord. And so the last five psalms are a hallelujah chorus sung by a choir that has a reason to praise him. So friends, here we go. Join the choir. (laughs) Let's join the choir. Let's join the choir. Let your words, let your whole life just cry out to God. God, you're incredible. And there's one more verse in this psalm that says this. One generation will commend your works to another. So can we teach the next generation to praise him as well? Join the choir. Let's pray. God, you are incredible. And we're here today because of that. We have joy in our hearts today because of that, no matter what else is going on. So I just ask that you'd fill everyone here um, with with that knowledge, with that hope, with that joy, with, with that firm belief and that trust in how incredible you are. Because that will give us, that will give all of us a way to handle and, and face everything else in life. So we're just here to thank you and praise you today and just, just enjoy your presence. So let us just spend these next few moments enjoying you. And then let us complete that joy by going out there and telling others about it. So that they might know you're incredible too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.